And then these are just other examples. You can read through the questions, but it's just, hey, what if we change the unadjusted amount? How would you fix the, fix the expense? Okay. So that was accounts receivable. I'm gonna go into notes receivable. We talked about notes receivable already a little bit, but notes receivable is when we give money to somebody and they owe us the money back, but we, there's not a sale. So I gave Mujaba some cash. I gave him a thousand bucks and I said, like, Hey man, give me, um, you know, a thousand, 120 bucks next year. And we're even, I didn't sell him anything. I'm just charging interest. So there's a few pieces here on this note, right? Like I, this is actually a legal contract I could would sign and then Mujaba would sign and I would hold it in my pocket. Um, I did this before I've given notes out before as part of a business. I don't like it. I'm not a bank. I wasn't good at it, but I've done it. And in this time, uh, uh, you, I literally had a piece of paper that said all of this. So this is what a note would look like. If you go to a bank and take a loan, it's pretty much this, this is what you're signing. So you're getting a thousand bucks. They own the money in 90 days after one day of the signature date. And they're going to pay 12% annual interest. A few things to know here, like just for life. There's something called usury interest. If you're paying more than like 12 to 20% interest on something, it might be illegal. Laws change, but you shouldn't be paying more interest. If someone ever charges you more than that, it may be illegal. 12% is actually really high right now. But just know, I wish I knew this when I was younger, but you can't get charged over a certain percentage of interest. Like if someone charges you 100% interest, that's illegal. They can't do that. And so you can always get a lawyer to defend you. Um, here, that 12%, is always annual. So it's not like they're not charging you 12% uh, monthly, it's 12% annually, so 1% monthly. So then we take that information and then we can determine how much we are going to owe and how much to expect to pay. So we have to calculate the days. So the days here, days in July are 31, minus the days on the note is 10, right? July 10th, it's 31 days in July, so it's 21 days plus the days in August, plus the days in September, plus the days equal to 90 days, eight, maturity date of October 8th is in the 90. So I might ask you, what is your maturity date? This is how you determine it, right? Do you have to go through the months? Just count the days, right? That's all this is. And this is how you determine your interest expense. You can use a 360 day year, 365, 365.25, for our homework, we'll be doing 360 to keep things e e easy. It's just another estimate. So you're just saying, hey, the, here's the principal on the note, 1,000 bucks, 0.12. I'm going to owe $120 of interest, but only for 90 days. Divide by 90 times 360. Oops, sorry, I did that wrong. 1,000 times 0.12 uh, times 90 divided by 360. It's a $30 in interest. That's just how the math And then let's see, notes receivable. This is if we're accepting a notes receivable in exchange for a sale. So sometimes we do it, I just give cash, but sometimes I do it in exchange for a sale. I'd recognize this as, as sales revenue, notes receivable. If it was for cash, it would just be I'd credit cash. So just read the language. Um, the language will tell you if it's for a sale or in exchange for cash. Here it's for a sale, sold goods in exchange for 90 days. And then when we recognize the interest revenue, it would be credit interest revenue, debit cash, or debit interest if receivable. So here's a good example. We collect cash of 615, notes receivable of 600, and then we'd credit interest revenue of 15. Notice this is different, right, than sales revenue. How is it different? Like sales, remember if we did accounts receivable on like a credit card, on a company credit card, it would increase the value of the sale. But if it's a notes receivable, it's treated separately as interest revenue and interest revenue is not part of gross profit. There's separate classifications. Yeah, that, that was my original question that, you know, what's the difference between the interest on a note versus interest on a sales? Good question. And it is important. 
Yeah. You can make a big value difference if you say, that's why companies push their own credit cards is it can increase their sales value. And a lot of companies care about their sales increases, their revenue increasing. Yeah. And then what's the, you know, sometimes it's called the interest income. Um, yeah. And that is below the net income. The net Not income net at the bottom. Income. Yeah. yeah. Below gross profit. Yeah. Below gross profit. Yeah. yeah. Correct. It gets more complex. Like you have gross profit, then you have net, uh, operating income, then non-operating income, then net income before taxes and interest, then net income after. So it can get very broken out. But I, right now at this level, I just want you to think there's gross profit and net income and what's above it and below it. You can also think of people call it above the line and below the line. Above the line means above gross profit, below the line means below gross profit. Uh, so what happens if they don't honor it? So Jay Cook didn't honor their accounts receivable. Oh, oh. So we still record the receivable. Yeah, the, the main point here is if they say they're not gonna pay the note, they still owe it, right? So we just treat it part of our normal reserve. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this on your midterms and stuff. I think that my, my main focus is gonna be your accounts receivable as you'll see. And then just understand the difference between accounts receivable and notes receivable. And then you know, we've already gone over making, adjusting journal entries for interest and whatnot. So I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Um, so this is just more conceptual. Sometimes we can sell receivables just so you understand other types of business transactions. Sometimes I can sell a receivable to a third party. It's called factoring. You're going to learn how to do the accounting for this in advanced accounting or intermediate accounting. But theoretically, let's say I sell a lot of my consulting services, but I want cash today. I need the cash today. So I could sell my accounts receivable. Let's say I know uh, a software company out here is going to pay me $10,000. I could theoretically sell that right to collect $10,000 to another customer for $9,000. So I can get the cash today. And then that other customer could collect the $10,000 in 30 days. A lot of inventory based businesses do this factoring of receivable. It's called factoring receivables because they need cash today in order to buy more inventory to accelerate the growth of their business. Nike is famous for using this kind of strategy to increase the amount of cash they have to continue to buy more inventory and take over the marketplace. So you can sell receivables or you can promise receivables like to the bank. I can say, hey, if something goes wrong, you can have, you can have the right to collect cash. So receivables are an asset, right? Don't forget that receivables, even though they're not cash in your pocket, they still like, have a value to them that you can sell to other parties. Just wanted you to be aware of that. Hey, um, I have a... Yep. Um, so would this mean that, so if I wanted cash and I, I owe someone else money, but I owe them, for example, like 10,000, I, I say, I'll give you this check, and, but then you give me 9,000. Is that how it sort of works? Yeah, there's a third party in this. So any way you can think of fundamentally, you can, that's a fun thing about business. You can do anything you want, like within legal, <laughs> as long as it's legal, but you, you, as long, you can have a third party. If you have a third party, there's a lot of creative things you can do. Like, let's say there's me, you and Alyssa. Okay. Say I say you, I owe you, so you a, a, a thousand bucks, uh, but I owe it to you in 30 days. You really want, uh, you really want to go on a vacation. You want to go to Vegas, but you need $900 today, right? You want to go this week. You got to show you want to go catch or something. You need $900 today, but I'm not going to pay you for a month. I don't have to pay you for a month, right? You oh. could sell the right to collect the money to Alyssa. So you could say, Alyssa, Devin owes me a thousand bucks. You can collect from him, but I need, if you pay me $900 today. So Alyssa then would make a hundred dollars on that, but she also takes the risk that I might not pay her. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of a risk game. Like, hey, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, no problem.
So how would you record the hundred dollar loss? Yeah, that's a that is not in the scope of this class, and I don't want to confuse the class. But it, there would be an accounting impact, um, and there's factoring accounting is rather complex. And I'm happy to go over it in after office hours if you stay interested, but I don't want to confuse the class on it. But yeah, there's a whole consideration around it and it really depends on the legal structure of the contract because we could, there's, you could factor with recourse or without recourse. Like I could theoretically say you could still owe the money to Alyssa or Alyssa could decide that say I owe the money or a bank could collateral. So the details matter in these kind of situations. A good question. The last thing is just memorize this formula, accounts receivable turnover ratio. We've done a lot of this. I mean, I would love to go into a, um, uh, a 10K like we normally do and kind of compare companies, but I wanna make sure we spend the right amount of time on the midterm and you all get a break. And I think we understand ratios at least. We've gone over it enough in this class where you know that you have just memorize a formula and uh, that's how you determine the ratio. And I'll explain what this ratio means. This is just how quickly we collect our uh, collect our accounts receivable, how effective we are managing the credits, uh, the credit we give. So our net sales over average accounts receivable is how quickly we collect our cash on accounts receivable. So you can see here for this company, IBM collects 9.4 times, my Oracle for, collects 6.8 times. So IBM collects its money quicker than Oracle. And so IBM would be argued to have a better cash a right, better cash management strategy in this case. So that's chapter seven. Any questions you want to go over? I know we went through it quickly. I'll make sure the recording goes up, but are there any, any questions? Yeah. I have a question. What's the definition of the, um, if you go one slide back? Yeah. Accounts at average accounts receivable net. What does that mean? Yeah, so that's uh, the net of allowance for doubtful accounts. We, so we okay. talked about net. So um, account, there's accounts receivable. Let's say their accounts receivable is 10 million. Their allowance for doubtful accounts, which we determined how to calculate today, was 1.3 million. That's where they get the 8.7. That's okay. what the net is. Yeah. A gross account, accounts receivable is not including the estimate of allowance for doubtful accounts. Thank you. No problem. And then the average just means the last year's and this year's divided by two. You add both and divide it by two. Great question. Any other questions? I know it was a lot, but I think we covered a lot of ground quickly. I think it, I hopefully we, we have exam, we went over all most of the examples that mattered. So hopefully you have a better understanding of it. Now I'll give everyone a 10 minute break then. We'll come back at 1025 and when we get back, I want you all to pull up your notes and I'm going to go through on a separate screen on, uh, so that, that screen that I'll be recording won't be your midterm. I'll just be going to recording your notes and we'll go through your notes. We'll, I'll help you put together your notes for your midterm and I'll walk through all the questions. So we'll try to get through all 50 questions, the theory of them. I'm not going to the exact questions, but we're going to be going, covering exactly what's going to be on your midterm, the theories. So. Hopefully that's helpful. I'll see you guys, see you all at 1026, 1026.